podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Here, we love talking about everything Batman. The BatmanUniverse.net has news, original content, and reviews about Batman comics, movies, TV shows, video games, and more. Check out the BatmanUniverse.net and join our Discord server to start chatting with fellow fans. We can't wait to talk to you guys. Also, visit our Patreon page and join our other awesome supporters. But enough of this nonsense. On with the show. Gotham City, like any other large metropolis, abounds in girls of all shapes and sizes. Debutantes, nurses, stenographers, and librarians. Gotham City Library, Miss Gordon speaking. Lopez hair removal, this is Jose. Holy transformation. One minute, plain Barbara Gordon, librarian and Commissioner Gordon's daughter. And the next minute, something new has been added. Batgirl, modeled after her idol, Batman. Holy apparition. No, boy, wonder I'm Batgirl. You are no longer alone, Cape Crusader. It took me three years to track down the Jade Gato and three more to figure out how to steal it. Funny, it only took me ten minutes to figure out how to snatch it back. No matter how you do it, crime doesn't pay girls. Mihi Noman est Stella at Hawk est Barrow the Oracle, the Barbara Gordon Podcast, episode 238 for September MMXXIII. Batgirl the Oracle is brought to you by MileHighComics.com, your new and collectible comic book store. Mile High Comics has an inventory of over 5 million comics from the gold, silver, bronze, and modern age, and over 100,000 trade paperbacks. If you're not into the vintage stock, Mile High Comics has a subscription service called the New Issue Comics Express, offering a discounted price for comics ready to hit the shelves. So if you're looking for vintage back issues or a great modern subscription service, be sure to check out milehighcomics.com. I'm currently recording on September 23rd, which is Shagalicious's birthday, but it is also Barbara Gordon's birthday. So happy birthday to the person to whom this podcast is dedicated. So I do have a longer intro, which I know the good professor Carolyn Coca does not like, but I did promise I was going to talk a little bit more about the surprise birthday weekend for Geraldo Chute or Harry or Harrison or Right Round or Harold, however you like to call him. Now, I think I already mentioned, and you'll just have to forgive me if I repeat some things that I may have mentioned, but this had been planned last spring. And of course, I have my weekly dates with Harry online and course I had, you know, I had to keep mom. And as we got closer, kept asking him like, oh yeah, what's the birthday plan? Which, you know, generally I was interested in what the plan was, but as it got closer, it was just interesting to hear that he was upset that the sailboat was happening because he went on at one time. He didn't like it. Why is he doing it again for his special day? And also taking some personality quizzes and one of the questions saying he doesn't like surprises and thinking, oh, oh, well, let's see what happens when when that goes down. But yeah, it was it was quite interesting, I think, especially 
as Donovan and I are waiting behind the car and he comes in and we stand up, I really cannot express to you properly what Harry's facial expression looked like. It was one of befuddlement. It was like the computer was buffering and just like trying to connect how these two people that live in different states were there then what was going on and kind of kept that way for a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I jumped up and said, Ooga Booga. I think Donovan said probably the standard happy birthday and just like nothing was going on. And of course, you know, the rest of the day I kind of checked in on him. I was like, how are you doing? Since we knew that he didn't like or doesn't like surprises. I did ask him recently whether he's changed his stance on surprises, but he said that good weekend vibes that happened cannot change his overall opinion of surprises. So he kind of just puts it in a category dedicated to itself. So I certainly have my highlights and I wanted to reach out to the boys and ask whether they had particular highlights. And I want you to know, of course, you know, Donovan is also known as my naked friend. Harry, I guess we could call him my fully clothed friend. But Donovan, during Putt-Putt, uh, we found out that his nickname in middle school leading up to high school and he was told it wasn't appropriate was Big D. So I might, in fact, call him uh, Big D several times. So I think maybe I'll give them the chance to talk about their experience with their highlights first. And then I'll just add in some of my portions just because there are certainly, well, there's certainly one thing that only happened to me. So uh, I'll definitely talk about that. So I guess I'll, I'll start with Big D. He mentions his reaction face, which again, it's just like, <laughs> I, I wish there was a photo. I mean, there's certainly a video because the, the mayor uh, took a video of that. Uh, my laughter throughout was a highlight for Big D, which I, I told you all, I think last time that I just felt really free. And Donovan had said, you know, I, he hadn't seen me like that in years, which is true. His parents was a highlight for Donovan. They're, they're amazing people. I, of course, give the mayor a hard time, but uh, she's a lovely person. And George, Haley's father, Kathy's husband, is also a lovely man. And uh, were so helpful to me, which I'll get into once I talk about some of the trauma that I experienced. The sunny weather, which was great. Certainly a contrast from when I visited last October to run that race. <laughs> My invasive questions about sex. Listen, I have questions. I have questions about race, questions about gender. And yeah, sure, I have questions about sex. Donovan, Big D, loves these questions. He lives for these questions. Whenever I go on my Labor Day trip with Ellie, we pound, we we throw out a bunch of invasive sex questions. And many answers. He always answers. Now, what's interesting is he draws a line at bathroom inquiries because, you know, I'd ask him just to check up, you know, did you do okay in the bathroom? He doesn't like to talk about it. He doesn't like to talk about it. I don't understand that. I feel like the, the sex stuff is way more personal and intimate than pooping, but he won't do it. Harry, <laughs> when Donovan had left, said that he was learning a lot from Donovan because I asked if I asked too many questions. He's like, no, I love that you ask a lot of questions, but my issue is, this is Harry, that I want to answer all of them. So I need to learn from Donovan to have like a filter and tell you no. But a lot of people just answer my questions. I, I don't like really have to bid. There are only a couple of people that I beg for answers because they're just not going to give it to me. But otherwise, it's just I think it's my my innocent face. And yeah, it just comes from a place of interest, really. Golfing and ice cream. Oh, yeah, which there were certainly invasive questions there. So putt-putt, that was a lot of fun. And then we had ice cream at that establishment too. It looked like a little town. That was, yeah, I won putt putt. I just want to say that. So humble brag. Watching movies. So Donovan, when this was obviously Donovan knew about the surprise, he said, why don't each of us bring a movie that we want to show the other? And so I was thinking about, oh, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? You know, I, of course, I'm the shipper. So I decided to go with You've Got Mail. And I was nervous about that because I really do love You've Got Mail. And when you love something a lot and want to share it with somebody else, you hope that they like it. And I was just thinking, oh, man, what if these people don't like it? But they actually did enjoy that film. Donovan brought chocolate, which is a Thai film, not chocolate. And basically, I remember seeing this before he lent it to me. 
because he very much sees the lead character as a Cassandra Kane simulacrum, I guess I'll I'll use that word. And uh, so we rewatched that. And then I think all of us had seen that before. So I think it probably was a rewatch. And then Harry, because obviously he didn't know, he was thinking about what he was going to do. And he decided on Prey, which was a rewatch for me and him, obviously. But Donovan had never seen it and kept saying, I need to get around to watching that. So we finally did watch that. And then Sailing, yes, which was also just a beautiful time. Uh, Let me see if I can pull up some photos, which I do have some photos that I do want to share. So first of all, this photo is the three of us shortly after the actual surprise happened. And you can see these t-shirts that I designed. So the classic, you know, child missing on the milk carton. I took a picture of Harry and worked my Photoshop magic, put it on a, a, a milk carton. And then it says also goes by in his list of names, which you can ask Harry all sorts of suspicious questions, but he never gets suspicious. So I asked him, could you please rank your nicknames in order from highest to lowest, like favorite to least favorite, which I am shocked about the Geraldo. Now that's how he is in my phone. But I just threw that out there one day randomly in the summer. And apparently he really likes it. So now I call him Geraldo a lot. And um, yes, so there you go. There is a sailing picture, I think, of the, the three of us. But it was raining, but we very much enjoyed it. I think Harry liked it more than he did the first time. Donovan and I did a a woke version of Titanic. And yeah, it was just a lot of fun. So that was Big D's list. I don't think that there's necessarily anything that I would add to that. And the sailing, sorry, it goes to or around Martha's Vineyard, uh, the sunset. And it was, of course, yeah, he mentioned sunny weather, but it was raining that time. So we got to see a little bit of the sunset, but the cloud coverage, I think, was hindering us a little bit. Okay, so highlights. (sighs) Yes. Okay, so this comes from the birthday boy himself. Uh, He says the big reveal behind the car, which I talked about. Movie nights. Look at this. Lots of uh, overlap. Mini golf. The boat. That's really interesting that he mentions the boat. So he not only enjoyed it because he did not like it the first time he went on that boat, but he puts it under his highlight. So I do enjoy that. The lunch snap. (laughs) Okay. I don't know what he's talking about. There are two things that he could talk about. So I woke up and had breakfast generally each time. And I just, I'm not much of a lunch person just because I'm not hungry really, especially if I don't have, or if I do have breakfast. And so they decide to go to this Mexican restaurant. And I make a big stink about, well, you just decided this, but we couldn't go to the pickle jar. And even though I didn't really want it, but I thought I would just be one of those people who's making it difficult for everybody else. Now, the other thing though, it could be is that due to the trauma that I will talk about soon, Harry and I had an opportunity to go to the pickle jar, which I do very much enjoy. And because I remember him coming into the room. He's like, you know what we can do for lunch? I'm like, oh, the pickle jar. And the pickle jar was closed. It was closed. I could not believe it. As we were walking up, I was even thinking to myself, wouldn't it be funny if this was closed? And it was. So if that's the lunch snafu, then boy, howdy, was it? <laughs> okay. He has something that Big D did not answer and I or put and I had on mine. So he said the walk to the beach that yielded spiky things and underwear. Okay. So that night, I think was it the night? No, I guess it was just during the day. I just always make Carrie go with me to the beach at night. But we, the three of us, decided to walk to the beach because it's only about a mile and a half away. And uh just walk around and then come back. I just, you know, if I'm in a beach setting, I'm going to try to go and see the water as much as possible. And on the way back, there was this yard that had these spiky things, which I can't, I looked up what they were, uh, spiky green things. And I collected it. And like the first time I picked it up, I like dropped it immediately because it did in fact hurt. But so then I had to hold it like this. And I began decorating the mayor's tabletop with these but I just brought them back basically every time I went out so if I went on a run and I passed that house on the way back I was running with it in my hand so I think there were about four at the end which I'm sure they're gone now 
but there also was this ball of cloth on the sidewalk and we were all wondering oh what is this and on the way back i would have kicked it with my foot to figure out what it was but big d decided to pick it up and it was a pair of panties and by panties i mean probably male underwear i don't know what goes through big d's head sometimes but poor decision making, I think, but he's okay. He has not had a health crisis as, as far as I'm concerned. River City Girls. Yes. Uh, this was a game that he and I were going to play co-op, but then without doing research, we later found out after he bought the game, cause I already had it, no online co-op, but then I thought, oh, well, we'll play it in October. And we decided to play it the night that Donovan wasn't there, which again, I'll get to why that is. No, it was a lot of fun, but there is this boss that we got so close to being, you just need to like one hit and then he killed me and I made a racket in the house. Birthday dinner, which I think was at the really nice restaurant and by the windows, you could see the water and the sunset. And this is where Donovan got some points on me for best house guest or most favorite house guest because he ate a quay hog or quahog, which is like a stuffed, like stuffing stuffed shell. And I had pasta, which apparently George was watching me and made a remark that I had pasta at the seafood restaurant. Listen, I got the chicken. It just so happened to come with noodles. Okay. And the treacherous ride home from the dinner. Yes. We were in a, a beetle, a VW bug, and it was a top down sort of ride. And on the way, <laughs> Jeez. On the way back, the inside of the windshield was really foggy. So that's why I was treacherous. So it, it mandated multiple wipes of a sweatshirt, I think, from or a towel from uh, the mayor as she was driving. And then there was like a hornet and the hornet, she felt it and tossed it onto Donovan, but she really tossed it onto me. And then there were some people riding bicycles with Christmas lights on and we decided to just go slowly behind them. So I assume that's what uh, he means by the treacherous. Uh, the present spy still reveal. Listen, I don't know how it's happened. I guess it's because I hang out with Harry one to two times, hang out with him one to two times a week. But now I get requests as to what does Harry want? He doesn't ask us. And so I had to be like, Hey, do you have a birthday list? And I already had my birthday gifts for him bought, purchased, not wrapped, but they were ready to go. So then he creates this list and I thought it was for everybody, but apparently it's tailored to me. So there's like intersections b between what I would be interested in him and so I sent that, you know, to KKC and uh, one of his sisters, and he was shocked because I think the first thing he unwrapped was Resident Evil 2. And he looked directly at me and uh, <laughs> because he knew that it came from that <laughs> list. So he was so confused by it. And uh, the spooning photo. Okay, so this is the spooning photo. Now, I think... Obviously, you know, you've been listening for years, or maybe this is your first episode. You might not know me, know me, but I think you know me well enough that I'll have kind of strange requests. And the previous time I visited him, I did have a request just to have a strangling photo, which his mother is like, yeah, I mean, she... I. I think she just kind of accepts it, goes with it. So I had this idea that we would have this three-way spooning picture. I went downstairs to get the mayor and she was out. And, uh, but then later I heard, you know, George say, Oh, Stella wanted you. So I'm trying to convince, well, not really easy. I ask all of them, Donovan's okay. I get to Harry telling him the idea. And he said, mm, maybe next time, which when someone says maybe next time, that's what you say when they ask if you want to donate to help save a dog. They say, not this time, maybe next time. So I thought, okay, fine. So then the mayor asks what I wanted her for. And I said, oh, I just wanted to take a fun photo of the three of us, but Harry doesn't want to. So never mind. And she <laughs> looks at Harry and made some sort of comment like, Are you sure you don't want to take that photo? And he bowed under pressure and said, sure. So here we are, the spooning photo. 
which I very much enjoy. I mean, I'm sure Harry is super duper uncomfortable by this, but really you just got to lean into these sorts of things, I would say. And then, yes, yeah, so we get to, he actually mentions my trauma that I have to talk about uh, with everything. So I will say, I guess we'll book and decorative basket, the panties. Donovan did get Big D got stung by a jellyfish. So again, he is in the lead for favorite house guests because of the quay hog, the jellyfish getting stung by it because natural thing for, for people to do up there and then taking an outdoor shower. So I was not going to get stung by a jellyfish. I did take an outdoor shower. And then of course I got negative points for having my pesto chicken noodle dish. And we get to Logan airport. So Donovan and I both flying in, I wait for him and I had warned him months leading up to it that when he got there, I was going to, I was going to give him a hug and squeeze his bottom, his little coconut. And, uh, he said, threaten me with a good time. So I took that as consent basically. And, uh, sure enough, I did. I did. I touched his coconut. Now I did tell my mother that I touched Donovan's coconut and she said, isn't that sexual harassment? And I responded, what's a little sexual harassment between friends? So I'm sure litigation is pending since Donovan is surrounded by lawyers, uh, his brother and his father. But uh, now he's got video evidence as well as text evidence and my mother as witness. So probably Harry as witness as well. But I just want to say that that happened. So Donovan are that much closer. Okay, so Logan Airport, the way out. So Donovan and I were more or less, I think we were supposed to leave at the same time, but then his flight maybe got moved up. So he was leaving earlier and I had an afternoon. So I said goodbye to him. Harry drove him. The night before I got a notice that my flight had been canceled, but moved up from like a 1 p.m. to a 7 p.m. And I thought, okay, well, that's not too bad. You know, the the shoots were nice enough to basically book a Peter Pan bus and I would I would take it up there. And I get to the airport. Uh, Harry had to drive me like an hour and a half to get to someplace and then take that bus and then go there, get to the airport. And I'm trying to check in. And I had tried to check in at the actual house, but it wasn't letting me. And it used like the within. And so I was having this debate with Harry about semantics. I'm like, well, this within is probably you got to do it this certain window, all of that, how they're using this preposition. So I get there. I can't check in. My flight is the next day. Tuesday rather than Monday. And I check the email again. And sure enough, it has that date. And so normally I'm very attentive to these sorts of things and details when I'm purchasing like Broadway tickets or all of that I'm looking. But I think I was just lazy because or relying on the assumption that if something were canceled, it would obviously be rescheduled that same day, right? I had never heard of something being rescheduled for the following day. So there I am at Logan Airport, and I call the mayor, and she's on the golf course, and she says, I'm golfing. And I said, oh, I won't take too much of your time. My flight is the next day. And she's like, are you bleep, bleep, kidding me. And I said, no, I'm not joking. And so then I had to, I was thinking about just staying at the airport for 26 hours, but apparently they shut it down. She refused anyways. She was not going to let that happen. But I ended up taking a Peter Pan back. So this, the airport is not close to them. So it's about two hours. So Peter Pan back, Harry picks me up and uh, end up staying, you know, that night. And then the next day I actually left. So let that be a lesson to you to always check, always check, double check, triple check your itinerary. That's probably for the best, but overall super fun. And uh, I was just reminiscing to Harry on Wednesday. I think that I found it amusing when after the surprise, we were walking towards the house. He said, does this mean you're not coming in October? And I was like, I'm so sorry. I still am. So I will be visiting him in two weeks, in fact. And we, we've got a list of things that we need to do, but we'll see what sort of hijinks we can get up to. Okay. Well, I think that intro is probably long enough for everybody. If I do Shag's Mac and Cheese of Comfort and Joy, which is the Find a Joy segment, of course, I think the Falmouth trip was, you know, 
it, just something that I keep thinking about and, and laughing about. But I will say that I had a really special moment. This past week was actually really rough, but a really special moment on Friday. On Tuesday of this week, the Latin teacher had to go to a conference and asked if I would sub. And I was like, absolutely. So she had Latin three. So I could basically do the curriculum with them. Uh, Latin three, but especially with Latin for AP because they're doing the Aeneid. And so I can translate with them and everything. And really the idea is to do the least amount of damage as possible and uh, really leave zero footprint, right? And so I obviously have my own teaching style. I don't know what that teacher does, but just trying to help them as much as possible. And then on Friday, I had subbed AP world history classes. And one of the students said, just out of pocket, you're such a good Latin teacher. I learned so much from you. And I was like, thank you so much. And it was just, I don't know, encouraging, edifying that number one, I still have it. And number two, like the things that I have been doing do work for, for students and you know, that I do know what I'm talking about. So I'm very happy about that. But it was, yeah, it was just great to be in the classroom and talk about Virgil and the Aeneid. So I think that's it. So we're going to move on to reviews. I'm just doing two birds of prey. I will say as a caveat, just to update you about my life, that probably for the next three months, recaps, synopses are going to be scant or I mean, generally I copy and paste it, but give, you know, the site that I get it from, but I am in my second to last semester of grad school, but it's like the last class I should have taken, you know, to complete everything because my thesis is in this class. And so basically, and the other class is a lot of writing as well. It just seems like all the semesters I've taken, there weren't many writing assignments and now it's all come down to these two classes so basically any sort of outside writing things I'm going to try to do the least amount of work as possible so I'm always honest with you and I talk about where I get things and I talk about my laziness a lot probably more so on required reading but here so just be aware that hey this synopsis for these two birds of prey not too good but I think you'll probably get a sense of what happens through my notes. And then obviously you should go read it yourself. So just FYI. So we'll start with Birds of Prey 74, Unraveled, besides this right here. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, we've got Canary, Flares Up. That was hard to read backwards. And we've got some fire. I don't think there was actual fire in the issue when that was going down. But uh, I suppose we'll allow it, I guess, to just show her rage and we'll find out why she is so angry. But yes, uh, the Tatas are strong in this one. November 2004 is the cover date. Writer Gail Simone, penciler Jim Fern, inker Steve Bird, colorist Hi-Fi. Black Canary and Hunters go undercover to a secret meeting where criminal sidekicks are trying to start a henchman's union. The two women start a brawl amongst the henchmen because they're union busters. The next day, Huntress takes Savant to see Black Canary. The two fight. Black Canary gets Savant in a death grip, and after making sure he sees that she could easily kill him if she so desired, she lets him go. Savant apologizes to Black Canary, and she and Huntress leave. And that comes from this DC Wikia. And of course, there are a lot of things that are missing from that. I will say that I read this initially with a headache. But I'm glad that I reread it because, yeah, that first time I just couldn't really think of anything to talk about. But then I, as I started considering my notes, I, the next day when I didn't have a headache, came up with a lot. So I will say that I thought that this was a pretty good issue. I appreciate what we see between Helena and Dinah, especially as it's positive and building foundations for a relationship. So things that we like to see between females rather than it being catty and dramatic. Now, Helena confesses she joined because of Dinah, which isn't much of a surprise, but Dinah does hope a relationship between Helena and Babs eventually develops. But, you know, both women, I think, need to drop something. Perhaps it's ego. And I think both need to consider the other with empathy. And we actually have a really beautiful, albeit short, moment in 75. So I think we start to get there. 
But I think, yeah, the empathy, because the one person is just not considering the position of the other. And this is for both sides there. Now, the union busting side mission comes at an interesting time in current events, given the writer's strike that is currently going on, Uh, thinking about Starbucks as well. So you kind of feel a little bit bad for these henchmen that get no respect. Some guy's butt was frozen. It's yeah, you know, you wish that you would take pity on them. I am confused about a couple of different interactions in this book. So one of them, Helena is holding up a henchman and making a joke about Joker and Dinah saying, don't do that when they're down, let them stay down. Now, I appreciate the compassion that Dinah shows this particular henchman and also trying to teach Helena to be less of kind of her natural way and kind of ease into the role that the the birds really provide. but. Isn't there consistent joking during fights and making fun of the opponents, you know, especially to get the last word in from from Dinah, really, in any of these issues? And plus, they were really making fun of them the whole time during that initial meeting of the union meeting before they start to fight. And then does that mean that Helena just knows where the line is from that one interaction? Or is this going to necessitate multiple times where Helena is stepping close to that line and Dinah has to tell her to step back? I think that's fine for a little bit, but I'm hoping that (laughs) Helena makes strides to change and evolve because it will get old quickly. And then you're like, why are you not listening to what I am telling you? So that was the first one, Helena stepping up to the line, Dinah saying, don't do that, but Dinah kind of doing the same thing in previous issues. The second odd interaction is Babs dressing down Savant about using blackmail for a positive outcome. So Savant in this issue says, hey, I've done what you told me to do. Aren't you proud for me, mother? And Babs is like, how did you do that? And he explains that he was able to call in many favors and basically get all these, it seems like politicians and big wigs to kind of bulldoze and and clean up. And he wants to start tabula rasa, clean up that section of town, but all these families are displaced. So that's, he calls in those favors to have those families in different places. And so Barbara is like, you can't do that. You can't blackmail other people. And he actually says, but didn't you do that to me? Which is true. And also I'm pretty sure she did some shady things. I mean, the whole reason she had money and funding is because she was funneling it from Blockbuster. So even though he's a bad guy, you're still technically stealing. You're stealing stolen money. Yeah, I don't know. She doesn't respond to him calling her out. She just says that she's going to fix the situation. So I think the fact that she does not address being told that you're a hypocrite uh, means that... mm, she might be one. Uh, so yes, there. We, then we come to this. Was there a theme uh, in this issue showing hypocrisies and just how difficult it may be to navigate this team? I think if that's true, I think that's a positive aspect just of the writing and of the storytelling that these people are human beings. You know, they're not, I think, you know, the one person who's not going to do this kind of thing is Superman and not everyone is Superman. I think these people are trying to be as morally and ethically right as possible. I think perhaps Dinah and Barbara more so than Huntress, but Huntress is getting there. And I would even say ranking them from most righteous to least might be Dinah, Babs, then Huntress, because you do have to remember the information that Barbara took from Savant and she lied to Dinah about that. So potentially, yeah, I think it's calling these people out and it's also probably a lesson from them. And if you think about it, uh, I think that we learn more about ourselves right in our interactions with and relationships to other people. And so Barbara and Dinah in those moments, interacting with Savant and with Huntress respectively are saying this and then realizing, oh, I do that. And I feel that it's wrong. So why am I doing that? So hopefully there, every, everyone in this issue is learning something. Fingers crossed. What is Barbara's responsibility when it comes to Savant? You know, she speaks on building him a conscience, but that seems like a weighty task. How much must she do and how much is it her responsibility? I don't know. You know, I, I'm just thinking about other people, gosh, psychologists and and 
psychiatrists and therapists and things like that. I, I think a lot of it is like the person needs to help themselves. Like you cannot fix the other person, which of course is like this whole romantic trope. I know of like, I can fix him. It's just not, I don't think you should go into a relationship with that idea. So I feel like Barbara can give him some tools and educate him, but it really cannot be her responsibility. <sighs> Man, it's the whole horse and the water and the leading. Oh, but on the flip side, if he goes off again and does something, it is on her. So there is a bit of a double standard. I mean, he's an adult and should be making these decisions, but we know that he's unhinged. Ooh, this is a big question. Yeah, because if someone dies, it is going to be her fault and her responsibility because she should have put him back into jail. And Donna, you know, is going to lay into Babs for that. So I guess given the stakes involved, if he goes bad again, it is a lot of responsibility. But I think he needs to rehab himself. Yeah, if we think about someone who's a drug addict, I mean, you can tie someone to the bed and take care of them as they go through withdrawal. But they, once they leave that bed, you can't, unless you're locking them up, you can't keep them from going back to the drugs. Like they have to do it. So if I use that analogy, I still feel like she can only give him the tools and kind of educate him about empathy and compassion and keep a close eye on him, like a really close eye. And then once, once he messes up, fire him. So basically Barbara needs to be Batman and um, <laughs> just monitor, monitor, monitor. And he crosses the line even a little bit, put him away. So the one time that I'll say that Batman's methods would be helpful. Ooh, just like Dinah. Oh yeah. You know, is it her responsibility to say Savant and why is he looking to her to do that? Yeah. He starts off before the fight, you know, talking about that time obviously where he broke her legs, tied her up and thought he'd be nice. But then she laughed at him and made it all a joke and he got upset and he was thinking dot, dot, dot. And then Donna's like, what were you thinking? He's like, "Never mind, doesn't matter. And then they fight. And then afterwards he thought, you know, he said to her, you've saved so many people. I thought maybe I could be one of those people. And so again, how is that her responsibility to save Savant? Why? Yeah. Why is he looking to her to do that? It's like he's trapped in his own body and he wants to do something but can't, which I suppose is any sort of um, exceptionality and uh, or disability. And maybe he thought she could look. But it's interesting that he would say that for Dinah and not for Oracle. Yeah, I'm not sure. Lots of deep questions and no one to discuss them with. But yeah, so some questions for you just about Savant and what are these birds responsibility when it comes to him? I don't think it's Dinah's responsibility to, to save him either. So we do find out that Dinah knows Babs lied about Savant's files, which is interesting. I hope that we have a conversation between Dinah and Barbara about that. I don't know if Dinah's waiting for Barbara to come to her. It seems like something I've seen in a movie before. In the fight between Dinah and Savant, we see the growth that Dinah has made utilizing the various teachings from her trainers, as well as the lasting impact of what Savant did to her. So I think we can, in fact, quite literally and figuratively call that issue and what happened to her a trauma, which is unfortunate just because we know that she went through a lot with the longbow hunters. Dinah I think needed to reclaim the power that had been lost, really taken from her during that whole episode. And the only way to do that, I think, was to have a rematch, right? And for her to be full strength to do that, not just on wobbly legs. In this match, I think that Dinah is able to model preferable behavior to Helena, though, again, there is some concern about the way she went about this. So she can show that yeah, you can, ooh, there's the edge, the line is there, right? Uh, no killing. We stop when it's time to stop that sort of thing. But it was just a weird setup, uh, lying to get him in there, beating up Creote, leaving him outside. And then there's this whole talking and then it's just really intense. I mean, they are lethal blows. Like it goes through and like anything that could land could kill. So I think that's poor modeling, but the ending is good modeling. I don't know. So we, we see Savant's perspective of that, their first meeting, 
which we hadn't, right? We were mostly in inside the POV of Dinah. And we also see, you know, men just don't like uh, being laughed at. And that's their worst nightmare. Isn't that interesting? So Dinah isn't ready to forgive Savant. And my question is, is that all he really needs to be saved, question mark, or feel like he's saved? I don't know. I think that's her prerogative. I've talked about apologies and forgiveness before on this show and with other people. But yet, you know, obviously some may balk at this message if we're looking at it through a Christian lens, since we are told to forgive people. And I think this is, you know, obviously a great message uh, from Jesus to forgive. And he is able to forgive immediately, right? But I would say that while he does tell us to forgive others, he doesn't say immediately forgive others. And I would argue that he would probably prefer forgiveness to be delayed, but genuine over immediate and performative or insincere. So I think maybe forgiveness is coming for Dinah, but not at the moment. She's not ready. So why should she lie and say you're forgiven when she doesn't feel that? I think that would be bad for both parties because the the hurt is not healed and she would not behave that way and he'd be confused and it'd be all sorts and she'd be acting up all that stuff. So I would say a pretty good. I mean, obviously lots of questions to kind of discuss. I'd love to hear what you all have to think about that. Just responsibility of Donna and Baz when it comes to Savant and saving him. And ugh, I don't know, but I think I'm going to give this a 7.5 out of 10 union busters. I think while I was able to get some stuff out of it, it's not a super weighty story. And it's really like different missions coming together, kind of a mishmash. I would maybe consider it a one shot kind of making our way to 75 and also because war games is going on. So I think that's probably what was happening and obviously addressing some, some big white elephants that have been in the room for a little while, like the information disc, like Savon and Dinah and their relationship, all that stuff. Okay. So then we get to Birds of Prey 75. Here's the cover. We've got Babs, which is a hashtag Carolyn knows cover because we don't see her body and Huntress and Dinah. The Babs, I don't necessarily know why she's screaming out. Kind of have the clock tower. Maybe it's in (sighs) mourning over what has happened. December 2004 is the cover date. And we have two stories in here since it is a larger oversized issue, two action-packed anniversary actions, adventures, sorry. So the first story is Breathless and the writers Gil Simone, artist Ed Benes, and Colors Hi-Fi. The building containing the clock tower is no more. It has been demolished. That's a nice way of saying that. The Birds of Prey take down a drug house and establish a new base on an airplane, Airy One, flown by Black Hawk pilot Zinda Blake. The opening, I very much like. A wordless intro. No words, just surveying the damage of the clock tower. Of course, Dinah is the one to reach out and comfort Babs, but I also love that Babs takes Helena's hand, less perhaps as a way to comfort, though perhaps Helena does need comfort because, you know, the clock tower was a sign of her new beginnings with the team and trust and relationships. But I think also taking her hand uh, speaks to bringing Helena into that circle of love and female camaraderie. So this is what I was talking about in terms of a beautiful moment between the two of them. He grabs the hands and then the three of them are just there. So I feel like, my gosh, yeah, if you were to pick one panel that summarizes the birds of prey currently and and where they are, it's like, it's probably this bottom panel, just this silhouette and finally a team potentially. I like seeing Barbara's point of view of the black mask and Batman fight and her opinions and thought process of the whole thing, because war games is very much, I think, centered on Batman, even though, you know, people try to maybe have some word bubbles or show different character moments It's mostly Batman. Right. So this being in her book, we get to see those feelings. I didn't really think of all the things Babs would have had up there aside from data, but it really was her home. I think we kind of forget that. It is interesting. She differentiates personal from important. I think that speaks to her sensitive side, which we see her kind of as cold and disinterested sometimes and tries to separate. 
certain things from herself, but I think we really see how connected she was with the clock tower. But we, she's lost her old Batgirl suits, which I think is symbolic, but perhaps and demanding that she move on from that for reals, for reals. So just uh, to mention that, but also, you know, photos and, oh no, that Nightwing and oh the Dick and Babs photo at the beach that has some sort of random person taking their picture that's gone forever. Helena shows a real strength of character with how hard she's trying to show compassion, even offering a place for Babs to stay. So this is what I was talking about. Just kind of putting yourself out there, I think, is the way to make a bridge. Dinah's silver lining of, quote, a lot of people have discovered the clock tower, end quote, is actually a good point because I think we've forgotten uh, we think it's an open door policy, but it really should not have been. And it wasn't initially. So yeah, it may be time to start from scratch and, and not have many people have the passcode to get in. I suppose Savant's files are potentially gone as well, unless they were included in her backups, but it's not mentioned here because that of course would warrant a conversation with Dinah. So we'll see if we get back to that. True to form, Babs's I need a minute is literally just a minute, but hey, that's why she's kick ass. So she gets back into it. We have a new plane, which is Airy 1, uh, a new base, as the synopsis says, which I thought, oh, maybe it's a new base, but we don't really get that until the end definitively. And then the remote for it is called Excalibur. Now, I assume that Babs took this plane and then had Ted check it out, but that particular scene is a little quizzical because it initially seemed like he was giving her the plane, and then he unveils the Black Hawk towel, and he asked where she got it. So that was just like the the most confusing and, and clunky, clunkily written part, just of where did this plane come from, what is Ted doing with it, that sort of thing. But I guess maybe he's... Barbara took the plane. Ted is checking out its schematics and the tech and everything and reporting to her. That's as far as I can get. Why does there need to be a bunch of people in white lab coats with him? I don't know. Now, I assume him saying she's a beauty. The second time is him addressing Barbara, which is interesting. He's looking at her and she's just rolling away. I know some people really do ship those two together, but doesn't seem like they're on the the same wavelength at the moment or really well I was gonna say really ever but no I think they were uh I think that he feels a need that not everyone does both of them have kind of that technology similarity maybe and they can talk about that whereas other love interests for Barbara would not be able to. So I guess, you know, in terms of people that we date, you're going to have some commonalities. And then I guess if you look at, you know, everyone you've dated, you can kind of pick out like I'm most, most connected with this person on this and this and this. So, you know, for Dick and Bads, I think you have the nostalgia, the history, background Robin. And with Ted, I think you know, superheroing, but also technology and a love for kind of that nerdy stuff. He's a catch. I'm sure it'd be great to be for them to be together. Uh, but I think maybe he's a catch for somebody else. Interesting information that Gotham is a quote, cape free zone. I am not sure where that is coming from. Potentially the police. I don't know. I don't know if Josh and I talked about it being cape free. Are they persona non grata? I mean, they consistently are, I guess, maybe, 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 I don't know. But that's why they're leaving. It's not really the best place. They need to go elsewhere domestically more so than internationally. I love that Babs has found a school for Helena and is actively working to plan missions around that. Though, you know, when something comes up, when a mission comes up, what are you going to do? Like, she's still going to have to call out and get a sub. I guess that'll be me. But I remember Tom and I totally uh, had a discussion about that and how unrealistic it was because of how often she would have had to to leave and the the bruises and things like that. It's just that's a hard line of work, I would say. Ah, there I found it. So I said, what the heck is Helena wearing? I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Look at this. I mean, well, you know, practically the students wear these sorts of things, but it's a strip of cloth on the top and a strip of cloth on the bottom. That's the best way to describe it. Jeez, jeez. 
Okay, a mission, perhaps their first priority mission after the current one will be to go after vigilantes who have crossed the line. So they are cleaning house, as it were, and they're going out of Gotham, but still domestic, as I mentioned. And I think the the war games is certainly carrying over. So that has had a greater impact on what the birds will do, as well as potentially other people in the superhero community. Babs takes part in the current mission in Gotham as bait, where they go after Tom Paul Jessup, who is a drug kingpin that Savant forced out of the the hamlet that he was cleaning out, but not out of Gotham. And I am not sure how this works with Black Mask as the kingpin. So it seems like there would be a conflict between the two of them because TPJ should probably be paying some monies to Black Mask and kissing his ring, but we don't see that. And finally, yes, I've been waiting to see Lady Blackhawk for some time now, actually. She has finally appeared. But the biggest wang bang zinger is Barbara saying, I'm not going back to Gotham, guys. Not soon, maybe not ever. The tower, it was more than our headquarters, Donna. It was my home. It's gone and I destroyed it. Everything there makes me sad. The rubble, Batman, Nightwing. I just want a way. I want to forget. And I'm no damn good at forgetting, which is true. I mean, that's something that I have to deal with as well because I can't forget things. Woo. So this is what, yeah, I kept asking Josh. Well, I guess I kept saying like, they just need a break from each other. They just need a break. And yeah, it's happening. It's happening. She's getting some spatial as well as temporal breaks from everything. I think that this is good and I think it's mostly healthy. I think she probably needs to work through some stuff, of course, but I think she does need to be away from Gotham. So I applaud this and I'm, I'm shocked, shocked that this is happening for sure. I'm going to give this eight out of 10 itchy wigs, which is what Dinah, uh, sorry, what Babs had to wear in order to be bait which when she wore that wig, because of Ed Benes, I kind of was trying to figure out who this was. Is that Dinah wearing a wig? Why is Dinah wearing a wig? But she had glasses on, so. The second story is There Would Be No Spring. Writer, Gail Simone, penciler, Eduardo Barreto, inker, Andrew Pepoy. And the synopsis, again, coming from DC Wikia, Zinda Blake is depressed because she has been hired as a co-pilot for a commercial airline purely for her PR value. Black Canary offers Zinda a job piloting the Airy One, and Zinda accepts. So I guess if I can just kind of think through everything, she does mention Zero Hour and losing her compatriots. So a lot of it is kind of the sadness of being the last Black Hawk, which I think we don't really consider when we think about Zinda that she is. Yeah. She's on her own where are her people. And so I'll be interested to see her journey becoming a birds of prey. Cause right now it just seems like she's their glorified uh, pilot slash chauffeur. So once that uh, turns into an actual teammate, I think that will be great. And hopefully she'll be able to mend as well from, from some of that hurt. Uh, Super frustrating just to see, you know, not being utilized when clearly she's very capable. She's a war pilot, uh, but they're making her a co-pilot. And then other women, well, using her for PR purposes, which, you know, this, uh, she thought it was for something else. And I'm like, no, you know, you can be a pilot and you can get this girl. And then also people complaining about her outfit as well. Dinah is the one to meet up with her and offer her, a membership, I guess, and like got something better for you, which I find interesting that it's Dinah doing this and not Barbara, but perhaps I think Dinah is more personable and maybe because she is the person who is boots on the ground that it should be maybe her responsibility to recruit and probably she and Babs have a conversation. This is what I imagine conversation about recruitment and whether they think that this would be a good fit. And then if they agree, probably talk to Huntress. That would be the best thing. If they're ignoring Huntress and these sorts of decisions, that's not a team. And then Dinah being the one to, to go to go there because Huntress is not going to. And then with Barbara, I think putting Barbara out there immediately reveals her identity. So I think it's probably easier for Dinah. 
And then we find out that at gunpoint, she stole that plane. So it makes it clear now what was going on there. So the Airy One was stolen by Zinda and brought. Uh, so it makes that situation clear, but not in the moment that writing. And I still wonder what Ted is doing and the people in the white lab coats. And uh, this was okay. It was shorter, obviously, than the other ones. I'm trying to think of what I rated it. Maybe a seven. Seven out of ten propaganda posters. Maybe a 6.5. I don't know. 6.5 out of 10 propaganda posters. I think, I mean, it's just a Zin detail. So I think I'm more interested in how she's going to be working with these uh, other ladies. So we'll see about that development. So finally, yes, finally, Lady Blackhawk is on the team, question mark. And we also got to see the repercussions from War Games. And speaking of that, of course, Josh should be back next month as we do the wrap up and more crimes. And then I can be done with that. There are no listener. Actually, sorry, that's a lie. There are listener emails, but they're mostly about war games. So I think that I'm going to save them for when Josh returns, just so we can talk about them together. And I, I think I'll actually read an interview that Big D conducted instead. But that's when I come back. And I will also be reviewing Birds of Prey, Volume 5, Number 1. We'll see. Does it live up to the hype or does it disappoint? Who knows? But first, in honor of Big D himself, Zias's Radio Hour featuring Peaches by In the Valley Below. <laughs> see you guys soon.
Welcome back. That song, of course, goes out to the peach and coconut himself, Big D. And speaking of Big D, he actually conducted an interview for DC Comics with Kelly Thompson. And in lieu of listener emails, I thought that I would read this particular interview. So the title is The Sky's the Limit for Kelly Thompson's All New Birds of Prey. So here are the questions and then, of course, responses. When the decision came to start a new Birds of Prey series, how was it decided to begin with an entirely new roster? Well, I think the origin is DC executive editor Ben Abernathy asking me if I'd like to pitch a Birds of Prey book and me yelling yes. And when I discovered that uh, they were very open and didn't have a lot of prerequisites, I just began digging into what I would want to write. I felt like, what if I only get one shot at writing for DC? So I shot for the moon. I asked for everyone I wanted and they just kept saying yes. That almost never happens. So I just kept going and hoping I wasn't dreaming it. Big D comes back as a card-carrying Cassandra Cain fan. I was thrilled to learn she would be included in the BOP at last. What's Cassandra's role on the team, and can you speak to what her relationship is like with Dinah? This is a great question, but I sort of hate to answer it because I feel like the book sums this up very specifically. In the book, Cassandra is quite literally the answer to all of Dinah's problems when she's trying to build this team and struggling to do it without Barbara. Cass obviously fills a different role for Dinah than Barbara does, but it's still someone incredibly talented talented and reliable at this kind of thing, which is also, or who's also eminently trustworthy and good, which isn't always something that comes easy when you're building a team this dangerous. I've been waiting my whole life to write Cassandra Cain, so the stakes were high and I hope I'm nailing it. Laughs. Harley Quinn is definitely the wild card of this new team. Can we expect to see Harley as more of a hero in Birds of Prey, or will she serve as a foil to challenge the more traditionally heroic birds? Harley is on her best behavior. Okay, whatever that means in terms of Harley in Birds of Prey. She's, of course, still Harley, but she and Dinah have some conversations in the first two issues that make it clear how high the stakes are. And at the end of the day, Harley's there because she believes in the mission and she wouldn't do anything to risk that. She's always going to be a bit of oil to other characters water that's part of her great charm and flexibility but she's about being additive here not destructive she'll still find ways to make her own fun though don't worry in terms of strength this is by far the most stacked birds of prey team ever was it difficult to write missions that would challenge the likes of zealot big barda and cassandra issue by issue definitely not but that's simply because I built the team backwards. I knew what our basic plot structure was, who they'd be going up against and what they'd need to fight it or them. And then I built the team out as organically as possible to fit that plot. As an aside, this is Stella. <laughs> That's just because I'm, you know, finishing up my master's degree in education. That's Understanding by Design by uh, McTie and Wiggins. Backwards design where you design the uh, assessment first and then you plan the unit from that. Uh, and the you have your course goals and everything first and then you go backwards. So FYI, that is what Thompson just said that she did. Okay, back to this. I certainly put my finger on the scale to get the team I wanted, but I did that by devising a plot that fit them very well. I think the only real challenge with this awesome team is that they're all so good and cool to play with that you have to be very careful that everyone gets their moments. The formation of this team specifically invokes the theme of family regarding how some of the members join and Dinah's reasons specifically. Will the Birds of Prey be more of a family unit or are the five members too different to ever become that close? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hope by the end of this arc, nobody will want me to change the team. They're absolutely going to the mat for each other here, facing incredible odds with someone they basically all respect and fear. And you don't do that for people if you don't like them. It bonds you in a powerful way. So I think they'll be very close by the time we get to issue number six. The cast will likely change a bit after that, but my greatest hope is that by the time we get to number six, nobody wants anything to change. Well, everyone will still want Barbara, but other than that, and laughs. So good job there, Big D, with your interview. And I think, yes, the glaring question and the glaring absence on this team is, of course, Barbara Gordon. And I do have questions about that. <laughs> Just what's going on there? Was that someone that Thompson didn't want on her team? Or was that one of the prerequisites that she talked about that DC editorial had? No, Barbara. And in, in that case, I do kind of wonder 
why. But in any case, we're about to do Birds of Prey number one and talk about that issue. So let's get to it. Birds of Prey number one, Megadeth part one, writer Kelly Thompson, art Leonardo Romero, colorist Jordi Belair. And an editor's note is that this takes place after Green Arrow number six, which means nothing to me, but made to you. And also, because I'm very short on time, I (laughs) will be lazy. So this was taken by either Jamie or Jaime Rimolda over at the Batman universe. So thank you very much. Megadeth opens with Black Canary, Donna Lance, and Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, discussing the gathering of the team. The only clear instructions for Donna is that Barbara Gordon cannot be involved. Donna is making a list and checking it over with Ollie. Ollie is impressed, but he wants someone on the team that can watch Donna's back. This is a cryptic statement, making the reader think that the people Donna is gathering cannot be trusted. Donna does have an ace in the hole to Ollie's request. The scene shifts to a battle. Batgirl, Cassandra Kane, is fighting a group of ninja. She is handling her own, but it looks like she may be overwhelmed by the sheer number of her adversaries. This That is until Donna Lance arrives and the two beat back the ninja. Donna then asks Cass if she will join her team. Cass immediately agrees there's nothing more important than helping a sister. The two separate to gather more members of the team. Cass's destination is Los Angeles. Oh, I did have a question about that. I just remembered. Um, She finds a fight in a bar. Big Barda is fighting a cadre of vampires. Barda unintentionally punches Cass before she realizes who she is and apologizes to Batgirl. That's why you never walk up on somebody unannounced. Barda helps Cassandra up from the floor and explains that the vampires are disciples of a former teammate of hers, Bloody Mary. These guys are just insects, but she does ask the quote unquote small bat if she will assist. True to character, Cass immediately agrees and the two face off of the vampires. As with Dinah and the ninja, these two handle the obstacle with ease. Now Cass explains why she is in LA. She wants to ask Barda to join the team. Barda at first declines, but when Cass mentions sin, Barda agrees. Elsewhere in Star City, a sleeping woman hears a call. She responds despite a dry throat (laughs) because of whistling and starts to get dressed. This awakens her male companion, ooh la la. It is revealed that the woman is zealot and the call came from Black Canary. She greets Grifter and talks on the balcony with zealot. Donna is calling in a favor and zealot agrees to join the team. The four warriors are now gathered together. Donna, however, says they need a fifth member. Donna thinks they are missing an X factor and Cass has an idea. She suggests Harley Quinn. Donna shoots it down, but Cass relates the story where she fights Quinn. The story is very short. And according to the other characters, she used very few words. The point of the story was that Harley almost beat her, take note there, Big B, and Harley Quinn is the unexpected or the X Factor. In Gotham City, Harley is fighting a group of clowns. Black Canary swoops in and uses her canary cry to knock out the combatants. Harley then sees all four warriors and immediately calls them a kill squad. Donna tells her they are not a kill squad, but they want her on the team. Harley is in awe with the four warriors and Donna tells the clown to forget it. (laughs) Harley snaps back and Donna turns to go. Cash grabs Donna's arm and tells her it's for sin. This piques Donna's attention, and Donna clarifies that Cass is referring to Cynthia Lance. Harley knows the girl and immediately says she wants in. Harley tells them the reason is that she does not like it when people mess with cool-ass little girls, and she wants to make sure that they grow up into cool-ass women. Now the five team members gather in the current Birds of Prey base of operations in Gotham. Donna introduces the team to Meridian. She's from the future. And in this timeline, she is known as Maps or Mia Mizaguchi. So there's the big mic drop, I would say. She's in this time to help the team break into Themyscira and really onto, isn't it? And rescue Sin from the Amazons before the end of the world is ushered in. Next We've made a horrible mistake. (laughs) Okay. So I was coming into this book with low, perhaps no expectations. You know, we hear, oh, it's another Birds of Prey. This is volume five, by the way. And there's no Barbara Gordon. It's a really weird team. (laughs) So really, I was just like, 
you know, whatever happens, happens. People are asking if I was going to cover it without Barbara. I'm like, yeah, might as well. You know, I'm, I'm doing birds of prey all the time, but really no emotional connection to it. I do like Kelly Thompson. I read her uh, from the Hawkeye, the Kate Bishop Hawkeye and Captain Marvel. So I knew that she had the writing chops. But, you know, I've liked other writers on this title or, or Batgirl and their storytelling often gets hamstrung by DC and it just doesn't turn out well. And again, there is no Barbara Gordon that I could see. So that's that's how I was going into it. Well, I am here to say that I capital L-O-V-E-D loved this issue. I stick with the statement that it's a weird as hell team, but the way it is written makes you forget about all of that. Thompson writes each character with their own individual voice that perfectly matches them. You have Barta with her awkward formality, like she's new here, uh, here as in like planet Earth. You have Harley with her zaniness and it falling flat because no one on that team really has a sense of humor, but she's going to keep pushing it. Dinah and her leadership, her sense of duty and, and queer struggles with what she has to do in regards to sin, as well as keeping it secret from Barbara and Cass with her inability to tell a story, which was actually my my favorite part, I think, and, and thought that it was very hilarious. The ending, if I were to begin there, blew my mind. Uh, this is not what I was expecting. I was actually thinking through, actually, if I go back to the top, as I was looking through the names that Dinah had on her list, my initial before I even got to this particular page was thinking, okay, who would be you know, somewhat maybe tangentially or maybe clo more closely related to sin with the this sort of storyline and also someone who wouldn't want Barbara to get involved. So she knows Barbara enough or yeah, someone. And I thought Lady Shiva would be a good pick, but as you can see, she was scribbled out, which is interesting that it looks like the people who are kind of lean more villainous or, or scribbled and then the, there are just lines through the other people so once we get to the end and it's revealed who this person is meridian aka maps i was like what the heck is going on just the fact that it is an adult maps has me super excited i don't know how much obviously we're going to get into what is that future like because i mean what is it going to be days of future past and uh we'll see what maps is dealing with and that maybe i mean that could be potentially really cool but obviously coming through time warning of an upcoming apocalypse now we've dealt with these before this is not new this might be like the only negative point i would have about it is like oh same old same old where it's it's an apocalypse issue we've got to somehow interrupt this timeline and figure it out but the fact that again maps we've got sin whom we haven't seen in a while and then the amazons are involved i mean this definitely has me intrigued and also, given this team and, and breaking into kind of feels like an Ocean's 8 situation, bunch of women together, and they're about to do this big heist or something. So I'm, I'm definitely interested. I also love the art. I guess I have like two extremes in my love of comic art. I do love the really bold kind of rock and roll style, like Robbie Rodriguez, but then I love this vintage feel, very clean, no unnecessary elements, and then kind of a faded coloring that we have here that for me is very reminiscent of Marcos Martin, and I feel like that's just kind of in my DNA because of Batgirl Year One and Robin Year One. So this is definitely, yeah, I'm loving this artist. I hope that he is on for at least the first arc, but I, that would be awesome if he continues. I love Donna's outfit that we have. Just love the design of her costume. And I love the respectful figures on the women. So we are not top heavy. I guess kind of you get that sense here even with harley who has potentially she might be showing the most skin yeah you get a little cleavage but it's not over the top and of course this is coming from what the ben is that i'm covering in 2004 versus now but just 
yeah, I, I love this art. I think everyone is drawn very well and, and distinct styles to that fit their character. And then body shape all makes sense. So this roster, quite interesting. I, I never would have seen any of these people together. I think the only people that really make sense that I would have expected were would be, of course, Donna and Cass. Zealot is someone that I don't have any background on. Uh, so nice little wild storm pull and someone that I'll have to potentially do research on, or we'll see maybe if the story and the issues that, that fall kind of give us more background because if I'm a new reader, which let's just pretend I am right now, I'm like, I don't know who any of these people are necessarily. And so it'll be interesting if we've got to do our outside research, or it can just be embedded in the actual story. And then we've got a new God. So we definitely have, I, I think, a bruiser, the leader, someone who, yeah, the X factor with Harley. And then I don't know about Zealot's fighting style. So I think we'll see. I would imagine that kind of the strength is between Barda and Cass. And then with Cass, I think you kind of have sleek, sleek assassin style. So I think everyone's bringing something different to the table. And of course, Donna, you've got a metahuman. So she has that as well. If I go back, it was just interesting to see the different people who were crossed off on this list. Barbara at the top and cross off Vixen. You have Grace Choi, Huntress, uh, Selena, Shiva, Talia, and Cheshire. And I couldn't read that top one. It was like quick or something like that. Katana is there. Man Hunter. Gosh, I haven't seen her in a while either. Uh, Zatanna, Black Alice. That's another interesting pull. And Fire Slash Ice, which is interesting that you don't just pull one of them, but they come as a package deal. So interesting choices there and very much the exception, maybe a Black Alice. I remember doing some research on her. I just don't know who that that one at the top is quick. So if anyone knows who that might be, it looks like it's Q-U-I-K, but yeah. So just interesting choices and the ones that she decides to go with the fact that Huntress wasn't chosen. So these might've been some Thompson ideas. And I also wouldn't count them out 100% because I could imagine maybe coming back to them. One of the questions I have, of course, is why no Barbara Gordon? I do wonder if this was a Thompson choice or a DC comic prerequisite, as was uh, stated in the interview, and whether Barbara, maybe after this initial arc, because Maps is saying no Barbara, if she'll join or be asked to join or told about what's been going on. And then I guess it'll be story related, you know, why Maps is saying no Barbara. It's pretty interesting. This is an awesome page just with all the stuff that's happening and uh, Cass and Dinah being back to back and then going off in, into the kind of a circle of ninja. Very cool. I love how easy it is for Cass to agree. I think that's definitely in line with her character, but I do wonder why she doesn't push a little bit more on Barbara. She does say... I can't explain right now, but we can't tell Barbara about this. And there is a dot, dot, dot. There is an ellipsis. And then Cass says, all right. So maybe there's some hesitancy, but I guess I would have wanted a little bit more pushback. But this, this era of DC and the relationship between Cass and Barbara is not as strong as it would have been in the previous iteration. So perhaps, you know, she's not going to push as much, whereas maybe someone else with a strong relationship would have been, but this is interesting. Can't you give me anything else about why Babs can't be a part of the team? But it's also like Kelly Thompson is talking to us as well. Like I can't talk about it right now, but she can't be on this team. So maybe it'll pop up. I do love the Barda and Cass <laughs> the first meet, which again, announce yourself. And then there's just respect after that, because Barbara said basically that anyone else would have been destroyed with that particular punch. But Cass 
did not get destroyed. And just this relationship, I think, is probably my favorite right now. I, I think you would expect Dinah and Cass to get along really well, but this seems like a fun relationship that I can't wait to see explored a little more. I do wonder how Cassandra was able to get over to Los Angeles. Where's that money coming from, I suppose I'll ask, if she took a flight, which actually begs the bigger question of finances on this team, because if you recall, in the original Birds of Prey, Babs was hacking Blockbuster's account and, and taking that money. So where's the where are the finances coming for this and the technology without Barbara's backing? I don't know where Don is getting that, but perhaps we'll find out. The Cass and Harley scene was another favorite, uh, especially because Cass, I think, goes into this particular fight thinking it's just going to be like anyone else, but then quickly realizes that she can't look at Harley and figure out what she's going to be doing. So just this particular page, I love that Cass is going in. Cass thinks that Harley's going to grab a frying pan, which is right there. Her thought is cut off and <laughs> actually Harley grabbed a fish to hit her with. And then the fish goes flying and all of this chaos happens and a bookshelf falls. It was nuts. But the best part of that, of course, is that because she was about to tell a story, right? Zealot has no idea. Dinah's confused. Bart is smiling and saying, small bat, that was hardly a story. You barely spoke. And then Zealot said, yeah, you should not tell stories. <laughs> this is not your strength. So that that whole scene, I think, is really funny and goes to show, you know, Cass is going to be Cass, but I think it's going to be played uh, a bit lighter. And I think that Thompson is able to balance the line right between some humor and like, let's not get into disrespect because, you know, Cass can't speak. She doesn't speak like the average person, I guess we'll say. I do like Harley calling Dinah out because Dinah is really dismissive of Harley. She listened to Cass. She kind of wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt, takes one look at Harley and is like, nah, 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 this is, this is not going to work. And Harley ca calls her out mostly for for just not having a posture of openness or willingness like Dinah didn't come in being open to that and and Harley calls her out on that and and picks up on that I like that Cass stops Dinah in that moment and and asks her to consider you know what's actually at stake and it also shows us I think we're dealing with a different type of Harley here someone who cares but will still do wild things so she is I think you know Dr. Quinzel for sure here uh she's she was sizing Dinah up and using some of that psychology that she knows so I think we'll see a smarter but wild Harley in this particular book uh, the last question, of course, would just be about sin. I think this was pointed out on X at one point by somebody that if sin is 16, how old is everybody else, especially Cass? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, Cass, I imagine <laughs> she might be in her It's very confusing just because of the bad girls title that they were clearly young. And you would think that maybe Cass... I mean, Cass is older than Sin, so is she in her 20s? And then what about Barbara? I don't know. I don't know. I think this is all a mess. I'm not going to blame Thompson for this, but it's just DC Comics, I think. Remember when they used to have a timeline? It was very nice. I guess it was the 52. And then now it's just gotten out of control again. So nothing's consistent. But yep, Sin is 16. So just keep that in mind. And I think that's all I have to say about that. Just those, yeah, I mean, the big question, of course, is just, you know, Barbara and her absence. I think I'll just keep asking that until more information is told to us, but it might be story related or perhaps made into a story related point to work with some prerequisites. So we shall see. But all that to say, I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10 birds, which is very shocking, I know, because I do like to pull things apart. But I honestly have no problems with this, just some questions. And then, I mean, I think it was a great opening issue. And you can't ask too much, I think, of a writer the first issue. So the question, you know, like Zealot, Backstory, 
are we going to get that kind of stuff? Maps, what's going on there? Barbara, we only have what, 22 pages. So I'm not going to be like, these should have been answered, but I am looking forward to all those particular points. So yes, we'll see what the birds of prey. So I guess it's here to stay on my show at least. Uh, So at least it's something that I enjoyed. Okay. Oof. Well, now it is time for literature recommendations. And I feel like my reading has slowed down enormously because of grad school returning back. But let's pull up and see where we have. Okay. I bought, when I was in tea ticket bought a book as a souvenir, Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. I gave that five stars out of five. And that is about a young man whose brother is shot and he believes that he knows who did it. And I think there are, he goes into the elevator with a gun in his pants and he's going to go and shoot that man, that kid, I guess that man. And he has seven floors to get down and each floor someone comes on and, and talks to him. And I won't spoil what it is, but it is also a novel in verse, but I highly recommend that. Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I give it, I like how it was formatted in an interview style. And this was definitely better than The Goon Squad. <laughs> which Tom thought that we were kind of, it was kind of going to be the same. But for Tom, I highly recommend Daisy Jones and the Six. And then I've yet to watch the show, but I'm interested in that. Red Carrie by Stephen King. And that is also the October episode of Required Reading. And, and I watched the film for the first time. And Family of Liars by E. Lockhart, which I accidentally discovered when I was at my hometown's shopping mall showing one of my friends around for Labor Day weekend and went into Barnes and Noble and there was this, I'm like, oh my gosh, because I had read We Were Liars several years ago and this is a prequel and I enjoyed it probably maybe not as much as We Were Liars, but I did enjoy it. So if you liked that, the original, then I recommend checking it out. Okay, so that's it for me on this part anyways. Remember, you can send any questions or comments to BackRollTheOracle at gmail.com. Like the show on Facebook or follow it on Twitter at BackRollTheOracle. Subscribe to the show on YouTube for an uncut version where I might be slow talking because it's early morning, but we'll get there, folks. We'll get there. Follow the Batman Universe on Facebook and Twitter as well and support the Batman Universe by subscribing to Patreon. Once again, thanks to Mile High Comics for sponsoring Back the Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. And until next time, fly on, Babs lovers. Just plain Barbara Gordon masquerading for a lark as she rides into the night on her special Batgirl cycle. Who knows? Is the dynamic duo destined to become the triumphant trio? Only time will tell us more about this dazzling dare doll. Batgirl! Ah, I love a happy ending, don't you?